since I've been standing here. Okay. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, start here a few uh, minutes late as some uh, students maybe straggle in. Um, uh, first of all, I want to uh, thank uh, you all for coming. Uh, when, when I uh, first was talking about this with Dr. Wilhite and, and Taylor Williams, uh, we thought it might be, you know, five or six <laughs> students um, coming to just uh, really, in a, in a rather relaxed way, talk about some of the history of this um, uh, relationship between Russia and Ukraine. Obviously, given uh, the um, full-scale invasion uh, that began uh, early this morning, uh, that's no longer the case, and uh, you're showing up here really uh, means a lot uh, to me, uh, and I'm sure, and I know uh, talking to uh, many friends in uh, the region, it means a lot to them, too, that they're not being forgotten in this uh, horrible situation. And I do want to say that, that, to begin with, that full-scale invasion is an important part of my talk tonight, because the reality is, is that Russia has been occupying um, parts of sovereign Ukraine uh, since 2014. Uh, and this is only the most recent round of uh, aggression that we've seen uh, from a, a, a government in Moscow that is very serious about not recognizing Ukraine's sovereignty. And so I do want to uh, say that to begin with, um, that uh, everything that I'm here to talk about is, is not an attempt at all to justify anything uh, that, that the Russian government has done over the last four years or over the last 24 hours, but also, as a historian, it's my job to try and understand uh, and try and uh, do my best to explain 
but I will say that those of us who, who study this part of the world, those who lived there and those who still live there, uh, are all uh, quite uh, confused, uh, I think, about, about what's going on, and it's been quite a surprise to everyone. And so to begin with, I just want to say that while I'm adding a lot of complexity, this isn't really a particularly complicated story. Um, you know, it's plain and simple an invasion of a sovereign, peaceful, independent country of Ukraine by another uh, country, an aggressive other country. Um, on the other hand, um, it's clear that history has been and is being invoked uh, in this uh, by all sides, uh, and in the cases sometimes being uh, weaponized as an attempt to uh, justify things that are happening. Uh, often, uh, if any of you watched Vladimir Putin's speech on Monday, you certainly saw an array of, of uh, cherry-picked historical facts, which um, some of them did approach fact, but uh, was often a process of muddying what's really a really simple uh, issue. But also, on the other hand, um, you know, uh, Putin has not been the only one who has brought history into this. Um, President uh, uh, Zelensky, president of Ukraine, has also invoked this shared history between Ukraine and Russia in his message, attempting to get to um, the Russian people, uh, reminding them of uh, their, t their past uh, shared history and, and hoping for um, better times and peace and friendship. Um, as is so often the case, unfortunately, history is not a simple collection of uh, facts, but we have to have a good faith analysis to understand them. Um, so to do that, we're going to go back uh, to the most recent round of hostilities starting in 2013, and then go back much, much further to really talk more um, about this longer term history between these two countries. Um, and I think of that very much in the context of not trying to play into uh, some of the narratives uh, of, of, of Putin and of the Russian side in this. Very clearly, I don't want to do that. Um, instead, I want to clarify uh, the facts of the case uh, and how complicated actually this, this history is um, between these two countries uh, and the sort of simplistic uh, rendition that he's given and as an argument for the, why this uh, invasion has been justified is not at all really uh, particularly fair or particularly good faith. So um, to begin with, uh, this is Ukraine. Uh, you can see it's located beside uh, Russia, Belarus to the north, also borders uh, Poland, Moldova, and Romania, and importantly, um, the Black Sea. Uh, also, you can see the large uh, kind of diamond-shaped peninsula, that's Crimea, um, and we'll be talking about that today, too, and, and look at some regions uh, it, it, more in depth as we move through things. But in November of 2013, when I think we can begin to start things, we saw public protests uh, that really began in the Ukrainian capital city of Kyiv. Um, and the spark of these protests uh, was really a decision by the Ukrainian government at the last minute to refuse to sign a uh, treaty with the European Union for economic and political uh, relations. And instead, at the last minute, they decided to sign a similar agreement with a Russian-led uh, Eurasian Economic Union. Uh, this caused many people to go out into the streets, um, especially in the main square, the Independence Square in Kyiv, uh, called the Maidan. Um, and these protesters were really a, a, a mix, as is so often the case. Uh, diverse interests here, uh, Ukrainian uh, nationalists of various stripes, liberals, and ordinary people who are really opposed to the widespread corruption of the Ukrainian president, um, uh, Viktor Yanukovych. Now, they called themselves, of course, the Euromaidan. Uh, and this was, came out of a, you know, a mix of the words Euro Europe and the Maidan, where they, the independent square where they were meeting, and also indicated their uh, sort of wish to uh, associate more closely with the European uh, Union. Uh, and uh, the protests quickly spread then beyond just the Maidan and in Kiev to the rest of the country. Over the course of the next several months, um, the protest uh, turned quite violent, um, uh, all sides claiming escalation um, by the others. Certainly the government was out in force, um, uh, often firing, police were often firing on protesters and killed several hundred over the, over the next several months. And by February 2014, the situation had become so intense that the President Yanukovych um, realized the gig was up and he signed an agreement with the leaders of the parliamentary opposition in Ukraine overseen 
the talks were kind of overseen by some representatives from Russia and from uh, various European states. And the agreement was that they would return to the 2004 Constitution, which gave a stronger parliamentary uh, system of government uh, and a weaker presidency, uh, and also hold new presidential elections uh, before the year 2014 was over, and that security forces would, would, would withdraw from uh, the streets. Uh, immediately afterwards, uh, Yanukovych fled the country, um, and there was a brief interim government that took over uh, and oversaw the upcoming uh, elections in all of this. And in these elections, a man named Petro Poroshenko would win uh, the elections with uh, a pretty solid mandate of just uh, like 53, 54% of the vote in a very crowded field of major parties. He himself had been former uh, high up in several governments, several ministries, um, was a wealthy businessman. And he had uh, used a lot of his wealth to support the protesters in the streets, uh, which had really increased his um, popularity. However, in those months between the agreement and the actual election campaign, things got very, very complicated. On the same night that Yanukovych uh, signed this agreement, uh, in the south of the country, things were already changing in the Crimean Peninsula. Uh, we saw uh, all kinds of complicated um, uh, moves by various groups, and it's still not totally clear who was behind uh, what in this. However, what was clear is that the Russian government was very upset about um, the potential for a, uh, an anti-Russian president, or a not pro-Russian president as Yanukovych had been, uh, especially because uh, the, in the, the city of Sevastopol um, was where, is where uh, Russia has their Black Sea fleet. It's one of the four major fleets of the, of the Russian Navy. Um, and so very quickly, a mix of uh, large Russian populations, sort of ethnic Russian populations and Russian-speaking populations in the Crimea um, and their elected representatives uh, and also uh, clearly behind the scenes and not so behind the scenes, eventually um, Russian military forces would occupy the Crimean Peninsula. These are the so-called little green men um, that appeared um, and uh, captured basically the entirety of the peninsula. With the government of Ukraine in kind of this transition period and in crisis, um, they were able to uh, quickly hold a very uh, disputed and uh, by international standards an illegal referendum on the status of Crimea as to whether it should join Russia or uh, not. And with the Russian military in control of the peninsula, uh, in spite of international condemnation in March, the referendum passed allegedly with an 83% turnout uh, and 95% supposedly voting in favor of joining Russia and leaving Ukraine. Now, uh, Russia claimed that the reason its troops were there were to uh, stop, uh, protect innocent civilians um, as the pro and anti-Maidan protesters uh, met on the streets of various cities across Crimea and across um, Russia in, or across Ukraine in this period. At the same time, or just after Crimea uh, became uh, occupied in the eastern regions of Ukraine, places that for some various reasons we'll talk about have large uh, Russian identifying and large Russian speaking populations, although not as large as Crimea, uh, saw similar protests to what happened uh, in, in Crimea. And just like in Crimea, there's good evidence of Russian uh, support for this, uh, that some of these protesters were instigated by the Russian government. Now, uh, it is clear that there were concerns among some of these uh, Russian speakers that potentially the new pro-EU, uh, more Ukrainian nationalist government might uh, do things like pass language laws that would sort of lower the status of Russian and increase uh, the status of Ukrainian um, and, and other things, and that they were very worried that their status might be threatened in all of this. And so in this period of, of instability uh, with similar protests taking place in all, kind of, uh, all kinds of regions across the country where there were large uh, Russian or large pro-Russian uh, populations, never a majority, but they were there. Um, they were uh, taking place across the country at a moment of, of Ukrainian government's weakness. And in two instances in the regions of Donetsk and Luhansk, um, with support uh, from arms and money, uh, from Russia, they were able to uh, seize government buildings in uh, 2014, right around the time of the, pres of the presidential elections there in the spring in May. Uh, so since 2014, these two regions, Donetsk and Luhansk, have been at war um, with the Ukrainian national government. 
the pro-Russian forces currently control about the southern half of it, uh, or at least did as of um, this morning. Um, and this war has been ongoing now for, what, eight years? Um, about 1.5 million people probably at least have been displaced by the fighting, 14,000 uh, killed. There were two uh, ceasefire agreements, Minsk I and Minsk II, that you'll often hear referenced, internationally overseen often ignored and not followed to the letter, but they did tend to stabilize things uh, and so that the front really did remain uh, with this sort of division that you see here on the map until again, uh, quite recently, it didn't, didn't allow for heavy artillery to be close to the front and, and that sort of stabilized things, although there was still ongoing um, fighting. This region, uh, known as the Donbass, short for the Donets Basin, for the Donets River Coal Basin, um, is, uh, has similar to Crimea, uh, significant uh, Russian identifying and Russian speaking populations, um, uh, just, like, just like Crimea. Uh, and I don't wanna give the, the impression that this means there was a majority of people who supported uh, the governments in Donetsk or Luhansk. They were a very um, vocal uh, and very well organized group um, that these separatists um, managed to uh, take control here. But I think this does raise some complicated uh, questions for us. I think especially as Americans, this can sound uh, incredibly complicated. Wait, there are uh, you know, Russians in Ukraine or Russian speakers in Ukraine or Russian speaking Ukrainian citizens or Ukrainian speaking Russian citizens. Yes, and all of these things uh, are true. Um, and uh, that is one of the questions that I want us to kind of unravel a little bit to make some sense of this um, and also, uh, you know, this question of, of, of the history wars, really, of how history is being uh, sort of weaponized in this conflict um, as well. Um, so for both, uh, to, to really try and understand this and to unpack some of the, of the claims, uh, how can we even see an, a, a situation in which Ukrainians, just because they speak Russian, would not want to, you know, would want to take up arms uh, against their government. And I think one of the things that we need to understand is that like so much of Eastern and Central Europe, this is a part of the world that has seen large amounts of, of population transfers, continuing incredible amounts of ethnic and linguistic and even religious diversity. Um, and uh, also that when we actually understand the longer history, we see that the creation of different identities, uh, Russian or Ukrainian or even British or French identities are actually long-term projects that are sometimes tied up with language, but sometimes not. Uh, when we're talking about Ukraine today, we're gonna talk about Ukrainians, Russians, Jews, Cossacks, uh, ethnic Germans, all of these will be uh, in Ukraine. And that uh, sort of multi-ethnic, multilinguistic uh, diversity is really at the heart, I think, uh, of uh, the project in Ukraine in uh, certainly post-1991, but it actually has a much longer history uh, here. So uh, in order to try and unpack some of this, we have to go uh, back a little ways, um, really to the start of a shared Russian and Ukrainian uh, history. And, um, you know, this is in some ways a history that, that Russians and U Ukrainians don't actually don't really uh, disagree on that much, except maybe the question of emphasis and, and whose history this is the start of. Is this ninth century story that I'm about to start with a, a, the beginning of Russia? Is it the beginning of Ukraine? Um, I would argue it's really the beginning of both. And that's more the argument that Zelensky was making that this long history between the two is important for us to understand. So the crucial thing to understand uh, about the just sort of geography, I'm an environmental historian, so the geography of, of Russia is a great place to start, and Ukraine also, that it uh, uh, has these huge rivers, right? The famous uh, Don River, uh, the Donets that I referred to, of course, the Volga, um, and up north, uh, all kinds of rivers as well. And this means that actually uh, it's one of the easiest ways uh, to get between uh, Scandinavia and the Baltic Sea to uh, the Black Sea and the Mediterranean um, Ocean. And that's exactly um, where our story would start. Basically, in the ninth century, um, a group known as the Varangians, which are Vikings from Scandinavia, were traveling these rivers, trying to reach and access uh, the incredible wealth of Abbasid Muslim Baghdad. Um, 
as they would travel up and down these rivers, they often would stop and set up various trading posts. Um, the people who actually were the sort of majority in this population were a mix of what are known as Balts, like the Baltic, um, Finns, like Finland, and Slavs that we'll talk about here in a minute. All of these groups at this time were, were pagans. None of them uh, were Christians um, yet, although they, they soon will be. So eventually what happens are these uh, Vikings decide to show up for a season and then they decide to, say, to stay, setting themselves up as kind of local princes, right? This is the Middle Ages, they have kind of castle type things um, and they're kind of this nobility ruling over uh, this local Slavic and Baltic and Finnic um, population. They call themselves Knyaz or Veliki Knyaz, great princes is actually um, what they call themselves and throughout all of this, the uh, the one princedom or principality created uh, at the city of Kiev, which is today the capital of Ukraine, was the first among equals. It wasn't necessarily the boss, but it was recognized as the, 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 the wealthiest usually uh, and sort of the oldest would inherit. Because all of these princes claimed to be related to a single mythic ancestor who probably existed uh, named Rurik, and so all of these are of the Rurikid um, dynasty. Now, who are these Slavs which make up the largest group and play a crucial role in this story in understanding the relationship between Ukraine and Russia? Um, they were uh, simply a group, uh, an ethno-linguistic group, we would call them, probably more linguistic than ethno. Um, people's uh, language changes over time. Appear to have come about, come together and started or spoke a similar language somewhere in the borders today between Belarusia and Poland. Um, soon they would kind of break out into three main uh, language groups, South Slavic, right, Bulgarian and Croatian and things like that, West Slavic, Czech, um, Polish, uh, Slovak, and East Slavic, what we will be talking about, uh, Ukrainian, Russian, and Belarusian. Now all this means is that their languages are very close um, to one another. Uh, it doesn't actually mean that they're necessarily uh, in any kind of political union with one another. Um, so as this uh, principalities of what we'd call Kievan Rus start to uh, organize themselves, you can see that it's really more a confederation than uh, a single state. It's not that Kiev is the capital of this, and it's not that Moscow is the capital of this, but there are these little trading posts set up along the river and these sort of competing princes who are all related to one another. The, the most important part uh, for our story is that in, uh, famously in the year 988, uh, one of these great princes, Vladimir the Great, will convert to Orthodox Christianity, right? The Eastern form uh, of Christianity, not the, the Catholic version of this. Now, we see this then divided uh, po polity here of, uh, of all of these little princedoms, uh, and that it holds on for a few hundred years until in the 1200s, um, the Mongol Empire shows up on the state. Uh, this is Genghis Khan, right? Uh, and between the 1200s and the 1400s, this region is controlled um, by the Mongols. Um, at this time period, the Mongols don't really send in their soldiers unless there's a rebellion or something like that. They stay out in the steppe, in the grasslands, where there's plenty for their horses to eat. They don't come into this forested region uh, where they can't do open cavalry warfare, and so they kind of need local tax collectors to keep the money flowing. And it's really out of this that the birth of what we might call a Russian state centered on Moscow starts. That the principality of Moscow uh, under uh, the, the dynasty that rules there really uh, manages to elbow the other princes out of the way and becomes the most trusted tax collector for the Mongol Empire and uses that power to basically dominate the other principalities and centralizes power. This is the time of Ivan Grozny, right? Ivan the Terrible, um, where he really has created this kind of centralized state and this confederation has really disappeared um, by the end of the Mongol period in the 1400s. Now, part of um, the, this Kievan Rus will be uh, sort of liberated, so to speak, under Moscow, and the other part will fall under the control of a new, another state, uh, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, which, um, you know, if you've forgotten, uh, is like one of the largest countries in the history of Europe, that big green blob there uh, on the edge of your 
screen. Uh, this uh, meant that for the next several hundred years, uh, people who would speak what we would call Ukrainian are divided. Half of them uh, under the dominion or part of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, and the other half under um, Russian uh, control. Now, quite importantly, though, the nomads haven't uh, disappeared. They're still around, and they're living in the steppe. And at this time, steppe nomads really have an advantage over everyone else. They fight you know, on horseback quite quickly. They use mounted archery, all of these kinds of things. And so if you're going to have a state, you need some way of dealing with them. And the best way to deal with steppe nomads is to get your own. Um, and so this is where this group we know as the Cossacks come in. Uh, in kind of the mists of history, it's not clear if these were some uh, nomads who were invited over into the Russian uh, state and into the Polish state, because both groups will have Cossacks, um, or if these were, they just were uh, peasants who kind of copied the ideas. Whatever the case, eventually these Cossack communities form kind of as a kind of border police, uh, border patrol of um, settled in villages, but masterful at mounted warfare um, and serving as a kind of uh, protective buffer between uh, the nomads out in the steppe and the uh, more sedentary regions, cities like Moscow uh, or Kiev. They're mostly orthodox, um, and this is partly because in this time period, um, Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth is actually a much more powerful state, really, than Russia. Uh, it's got better at tax collecting and passing laws in a lot of ways. And so um, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, ruled by Catholics, largely uh, causes a lot of these uh, Cossacks who don't really like being told what to do um, to, to stick with or convert to um, orthodoxy. One of the groups of these Cossacks are known as the Zaporozhian Cossacks under uh, the Hetman, this means like chieftain basically, uh, Botan uh, Chmielinski, and they uh, quite famously between 1648 and 1657 have a large revolt. And some will point to this revolt by these Cossacks as the, um, uh, the birth of uh, a Ukrainian state. Um, uh, there's various versions of when Ukraine starts, but one of them will be connected to this revolt here. So over this long-term revolt, as they're trying to throw off Polish rule, these Cossacks, who are speaking Ukrainian, uh, largely controlling territories with Ukrainian-speaking peasants in them, um, are having trouble defeating the Poles. And they actually, in 1654, go to Russia and sign a treaty with them. Uh, this treaty is viewed by them as a treaty of mutual support and aid, and viewed by the Russians as uh, a, a treaty of uh, subservience, and that they are now coming into um, the Russian Empire for protection, right? Um, so this uh, revolt continues um, for quite a while, and here we should note that when this treaty is being negotiated, um, Ukrainian and Russian are different languages already. They have to have translators uh, to actually make sure that everyone understands one another. So probably before this, but as back, far back as 1650s, Ukrainian and Russian are different languages. Um, this treaty uh, eventually will split the Cossack territory. Half of it will stay with uh, Poland. The other half will come over to um, Russia. And the part that comes into Russia initially is kind of independent. It's this thing called the Cossack Hetmanate, um, uh, ruling over peasants and Cossacks, um, and initially has a lot of autonomy and independence from the Russian state. But as the Russian state gets more powerful under leaders like Peter the Great and Catherine the Great in the early 1700s, uh, their power becomes largely ceremonial and the post is dissolved in the, er, in the mid 1700s. Similarly, in Poland, uh, Poland will disappear from the map in a series of uh, wars and partitions. By the end of the 1700s, uh, the last so-called partition of Poland in 1795 will take away the last piece of Polish territory. That's a division between the Russian Empire, um, the Prussian uh, uh, state, and uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And so in, this, in these partitions, once again, some Ukrainian speakers will end up under Russian rule, and some of them will end up under Austro-Hungarian rule in that other great multi-ethnic, uh, multinational empire. 
So that's where things stand at the beginning of the 1800s, which my students will know is the time of nationalism and the creation of national identity, which I think is really important for us to understand and think about how these uh, national identities are not primordial. Uh, you know, people have not been thinking of themselves as Russians since the year one, nor have they been thinking of themselves as English since the year one, that these identities are really shifted and formed under historical uh, realities. Uh, in Europe, at the end of the 1700s with the French Revolution, and then of course uh, the revolutions of 1848, we see the idea of kind of romantic nationalism uh, grow. And it, this is an idea that is really quite new. Uh, and I think sometimes because we live in a world in which nationalism is accepted as normal, we sometimes forget that it's a, it's, it's a new idea. And it really comes down to kind of two main ideas. Uh, they're quite simple. First, borders should be drawn so that everyone within the borders of a state share cultural characteristics. And the second of these is that identification with a nation's culture should be the main characteristic of political loyalty. And even more, it should be your primary identity that above all, we need to think of ourselves not as Democrats or Republicans or Tennesseans or Oregonians, but instead as Americans, and that is where our primary political identity should lay. That's not been true throughout the history of the world until quite recently. We don't know what people in Russia or Ukraine really thought of themselves before the 1800s, especially um, an illiterate uh, serf or peasant they probably thought of themselves in religious terms, probably identified as Orthodox or Jewish or Catholic or Uniate Catholic, this other branch of um, uh, Orthodoxy. So they practice, uh, they do the same ceremonies as the Orthodox do, but they recognize the authority of the Pope in Rome uh, existing in this kind of in-between space here in Central Europe. Perhaps they thought of themselves as belonging to a particular village or a region. Now, this is important. It doesn't mean that Ukrainians didn't exist and Russians did. It means that the way of thinking of, uh, of, uh, of ourselves didn't exist in the same way that it did. And we've, we've gone beyond that now with this creation of national identities. And things really do start to change even in Ukraine and Russia in the early 1800s. But it really starts among elites. It starts as an attempt to create a Ukrainian or a Russian literature, um, to codify the language in a single way, and finding a so-called authentic voice for each of these, uh, as happens in Poland or France, for that matter, at the same time. In the case of Ukrainians, they're doing this at a very dangerous time. Um, they're living either in the Russian Empire or in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, both of them multi-ethnic, multilinguistic, and multi-confessional empires that are a very poor fit for nationalism. And it's the nationalism of the First World War that will cause the collapse of all multinational, multi-ethnic, multi-confessional empires, the Austro-Hungarians, the Russians, and of course, uh, often forgotten, the Ottoman Empire in Turkey. Now, in the 1800s, various uh, Russian czars, in particular, uh, institute a program of Russification, um, forcing schools to teach only Russian language, um, uh, repression of Ukrainian speakers, uh, mostly among uh, elites, um, especially uh, repression of um, Catholic or Uniate uh, Orthodox in practice, but following the Pope, uh, all of these viewed as a threat to the governing ideas of Russian czars in the, in the 1800s uh, that were supposed to center nationalism, uh, orthodoxy, and autocracy. But the germ uh, of the idea of nationalism is there very clearly among certain uh, Ukrainians, a lot of Ukrainians, although at the same time, some are going to take a different path. Some are going to look towards this idea of pan-Slavism. Perhaps all Slavs can be united under a single banner. Um, uniting Czechs and Russians and Ukrainians. Um, some of them uh, might want Russian leadership in this project. Some of them certainly did not. Again, a complicated and diverse uh, group of people. It also might benefit you at this time to learn Russian language. If you live in um, the Russian Empire, of course there would be some benefit in this. This all will change with the First World War as Russia and the Austro-Hungarian Empire end up on two separate sides as both empires collapse. And it means that it's in the middle of this period of extended chaos for several decades that um, 
we will see uh, the creation and the solidification and the shifting of people's identities in these places. Um, it's total chaos during the First World War and during the period immediately after the First World War when the borders of what is today modern Ukraine uh, are drawn. Um, uh, and they will change many times over the course of this. But it's really partly because of that chaos driven by this. Um, we see uh, with the beginning of the First World War, of course, um, Russia will collapse in March 1917 in the middle of fighting the war. There will be a revolution uh, led largely, started largely by um, women uh, protesting the price of bread in uh, the capital city of Petersburg who will overthrow um, the czar and bring down his government and then a brief period uh, before uh, October of that year when Lenin and the Bolsheviks with their communist ideology will seize power. And in that period of that overall revolution, there are Ukrainians who are setting up Ukrainian states and attempting several different versions of it. Sometimes a nationalist version. There's attempts to create Cossack states. There's even the largest anarchist state ever created in history under the leadership of Nestor Machno uh, in the middle of this period as well. This is in part because the collapse of uh, the empire is followed immediately by the Russian Civil War, which takes place between 18, 1918 and 1921. Uh, and most of the heaviest fighting, or much of the heaviest fighting, takes place in Ukraine. Uh, cities captured, recaptured multiple times. Again, uh, changing your political, your linguistic, or your cultural identity might very well be a question of, of life or death. By the end of it, of course, um, we see um, Lenin and the Bolsheviks winning uh, the war by 1921. Uh, and Lenin was um, a communist uh, who believed that you should have these universal ideals of self-determination. Um, but he's also a realist, and he wants as much of the Russian Empire back as he can. And so the sort of agreed upon settlement and the organization of the Soviet Union will be of these indiv independent republics. Uh, eventually there will be 15 of them, Russia or Ukraine or Estonia, that are free to leave this union, which is what will bring it down in, in 1991. But also importantly, the, Russian, uh, the Soviets are a developmentalist kind of uh, state that want to modernize and change. Uh, they want to industrialize. They build cities. There's a huge project of urbanization that goes with this before and after World War II. And that means that large numbers of people move around. Again, we've had large numbers of people moving around during the First World War. We're going to have that again in the period in between now uh, as part of uh, the planned economy of the Soviet Union. Now, this means that large numbers of Russian will Russians will come into this region. Sometimes they were there, sometimes they weren't there, especially in the Donetsk River coal basin, that important industrial heartland, a kind of a you know, West Virginia, Western Pennsylvania of uh, the Soviet Union that really is the, one of the major steel and coal producing uh, regions, changing the demography uh, and the demographic makeup of Ukraine even more. The, the demography also changes, of course, because of the famine that strikes uh, all of the Soviet Union and especially hard hits, hits the Ukraine hard, hits Ukraine hard in 1931 and 1932. Um, uh, and many nationalists still today uh, identify this as, as being targeted in particular for um, their resistance during the Civil War as this famine being punishment. Uh, whatever the case between the famine and the Civil War, uh, Ukraine will lose millions of, uh, of people, Russian speakers, Ukrainian speakers alike. World War II, of course, will also dramatically change the demography of uh, Ukraine. Uh, this is where the Holocaust actually takes place. In the 1700s, Catherine the Great invited uh, in uh, Jews from all of Europe to settle in this region of the Russian Empire, the Pale of Settlement, uh, as it was called. Um, and that meant that this was the most uh, heavily populated part of the uh, of Europe, uh, of European Jews. And that, of course, was also directly in the path of uh, the German invasion and uh, the Holocaust would kill millions of uh, Ukrainian Jews and redraw the borders of Ukraine again. Now, it's, it's also a race war not just against Jews, but also against Slavs, and so millions of Ukrainians die in the Nazi occupation. Um, uh, and so, so much so um, that, uh, you know, it, it's really uh, difficult to un overestimate the effects of this war 
uh, on, uh, on Ukrainian people. Uh, again, a multi-ethnic, multi-linguistic, multi-confessional place. When I say Ukrainian people, I really just mean people living in Ukraine. After the war, that process of industrialization and urbanization continues. Also, there's a slight change to the map as Crimean Peninsula is given to Russia, or given by Russia to Ukraine in uh, 1954 by the Premier Nikita Khrushchev. Um, the reasons for this are still very unclear. Um, actually, the, the majority of the people who lived here were the leftovers of those Muslim nomads, the Crimean Tatar Khanate held out here until the 1700s. Um, and it was under uh, the rule of Stalin that large numbers of these Crimean Tatars whose uh, loyalty was suspect, as was everyone's, to Stalin, uh, and they were deported from this peninsula and new um, settlers were, were, of course, then brought in. So by then, uh, the 1980s, when the Soviet Union is collapsing into 1991, um, you know, we do see a, a, a spike in Ukrainian nationalism, just like we see across all of the Soviet Union. So many problems come from uh, the center. Um, nationalism was even uh, popular in Russia, right? Uh, that the Soviet Union was what was unpopular. And Ukraine was really the one who decided to end the union. They held uh, an election, a referendum in 1991, free and fair, and 84% turnout, 92% uh, of people living in Ukraine, Ukrainian speakers, Jews, Russians, Cossacks, uh, uh, there weren't official anymore Cossacks anymore, all voted in favor of an independent Ukraine at that point with the borders as they've been internationally recognized. Now, in the 90s and early 2000s, Ukraine was struggling economically, much the same as Russia was. The old economy built on agriculture, built on industrial power, um, and the centralized planning was uh, really hard hit. And so that meant especially those regions in the east, the Donetsk, Donbass, uh, faced significant economic um, hardship. Um, at a time of corruption driven largely by uh, the rapid uh, introduction of the market economy as uh, the, the planned economy of the Soviet Union uh, was replaced meant that few oligarchs, a few very, very wealthy people got their hands on the majority of wealth and most people did quite poorly. Uh, the same thing happened actually in Russia. Now interestingly, probably not that bad relations between Russia and Ukraine until quite recently. Um, Ukraine was integral in the economy of the Soviet Union, so it was very closely tied with, as we know, gas pipelines and things like that to Russia proper, and they continued to house the nasal, naval base uh, at Sevastopol in the Crimean Peninsula as well. Um, and we see kind of re relatively moderate nationalist politicians or even pro-Russian politicians uh, in this period, widely seen as corrupt, whatever their stripe, um, and largely keeping the status quo. Ukraine was actually doing quite well until economically, until the, uh, briefly in the early 2000s, until the financial crisis in 2008, when things got um, a lot worse. And so on the eve then of the Euromaidan uh, protests in 2013, 2014, we really do see kind of a worse and worse attitude, less and less patience with the old corrupt elites, and a whole new uh, spirit of looking towards uh, other former communist states, Estonia, Czech Republic, uh, Poland, who were now doing quite well, who had joined the European Union, who had joined um, NATO. So that is the situation that Ukraine then found itself uh, uh, in 2013, was this uh, renewed spirit, uh, most people looking towards um, uh, the West, so to speak, uh, looking towards the European Union, um, excited about those economic possibilities since it felt that the others had sort of run their course and didn't seem to be um, going anywhere. At the same time, of course, uh, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization that was started um, to oppose um, uh, Soviet expansion in the post-World War II period and the Warsaw Pact was continuing to um, admit members who had previously belonged to that Warsaw Pact, the pro-Soviet bloc. Um, and this was something that uh, the Russian uh, government, especially Vladimir Putin, have been very vocally uh, against and have argued um, that they are very much under threat uh, with NATO, um, in their words, on their doorstep. Uh, and that is really where we find ourselves actually now. Uh, I don't have any great insight into why Putin is doing what he has done. Um, I think that actually few people really know. Uh, we have some guesses. 
that there is a, uh, a, a desire to, to clearly control and dominate this region, um, that it is about a particular type of strength, a kind of classic great game uh, politics with spheres of influence, and he believes Russia's uh, national uh, pride is on the line, uh, and that it needs to be a great power, um, certainly once again. The fact that this is happening also at a time where the kind of uh, Western liberalism does seem to be weakening um, with authoritarian or authoritarian light, um, uh, anti-democratic movements on the march in places like Hungary or Poland um, with, you know, kind of nationalist uh, governments in those, uh, those places, a belief maybe that the U.S. and Britain and these other places with Brexit are, are weak or divided. All of this might point to um, some reasons that Putin might see uh, an opportunity here. On the other hand, it's important to note that this is happening at a time that Russia is getting weaker and weaker. Um, uh, the, the financial crisis hits Russia very, very hard um, in, in 2008, um, and uh, that perhaps, you know, nationalism really is um, a, a place for him to hide out and try to hold on to power. But it's not all clear, at all clear, what he wants how far he's willing to go with this or even what the uh, end game is. Does he want to control all of Ukraine? Does he only want to install a puppet? Um, I think that anyone who tells you they know that for sure, whose name is not uh, Vladimir Putin, uh, is, is not really uh, uh, telling you the truth. So um, with that, I, I really uh, do want to open, uh, open things up for questions um, and, uh, and do my best to answer. Again, I uh, am uh, certainly not uh, an expert on Ukraine. Uh, I'm a historian of the Soviet Union, so I know uh, certain things about uh, uh, Ukraine and Russia. Uh, lived in Russia for a while, and, uh, but I'm not a, a political scientist or any of those types of things. Uh, these are just my best guesses, and I think also in the context in which history is being weaponized in this way, I think it's important for us as historians to try and, try and push back and also, you know, uh, it, it is war, and we don't get to choose <laughs> exactly. Um, sometimes we're called to do things that we're not quite comfortable with, but uh, we'll take questions now, if there are any. Yeah. I can try. Yeah. Uh-huh. Of, of whether... Sorry, of, of whether of you Yeah, so uh, NATO is a military alliance. I mean, if um, a, uh, a country is attacked in NATO, um, the other countries that are part of it, which includes the United States, are treaty bound to defend that country. Uh, and so uh, part of that defense means stationing military units, um, missiles, things like that in those places. Um, and so, you know, it means that there are um, military forces from the United States in Estonia or Latvia on the borders of Russia. Um, and so to him, this is a, this is a, a, a threat, right? Why are we there if we're not part of NATO? So Ukraine is not part of NATO, but all the other places in blue so are. Okay. So, um, but there were talks um, of, especially after the seizing of Crimea in 2014, um, uh, one of the things that the Ukrainian government was very nervous about was that something like this would happen again, and, as it did. Uh, and so the, the hope was, was that closer support, closer integration with NATO um, would potentially protect them from something like this. I, I think that it is very likely, yes, I mean that, you know, a scared dog will bite, right? Uh, and. Uh, I don't want to, uh, I'm guessing, but I think that that's a, he does harp on NATO a lot. Uh, like, his speeches are just full of, of NATO as this big, aggressive boogeyman threat. Um, yeah. I think there's a question over here, too. Hmm. 
I mean, as a historian, I will say no, because history never repeats itself. Um, and that's a cop-out answer, I know. Um, but also, um, you know, I do think uh, that the situation is, is different because, um, you know, there, that in that situation, there were not Russian soldiers in Serbia uh, and Kosovo. Uh, whereas potentially, um, well, there are Russian soldiers now in Ukraine. And so um, if NATO were to, were to fight Russian troops in Ukraine, they're fighting Russian troops. Uh, and Russia has nuclear weapons, right? Uh, and so everyone wants to avoid that, uh, we hope, right? Um, I think that, um, is, is that kind of answering your question? Or, yeah. or did you mean something else? Yeah. I mean, do you mean that? We'll take drastic. I mean, I think it. It. it, it lo it's. <laughs> who knows? Uh, it's looking that way. Uh, the. The. Um, you know, the rhetoric has been very, very stern. Um, it's the first day. Um, there are already pretty clear uh, sanctions being started to be put in place. Um, I, but I think there's. You know, there are limits to sanctions. I mean, one of the things. You know, Russia's already been sanctioned. Um, and there are sanctions against Putin and others from the Mengitsky Act and all of that. So uh, they have, they've weathered the first round of sanctions pretty well. Um, and I, I, it's unclear like whether that will actually um, topple them or not. Um, one thing I will say is that um, one of the, today has been an awful day. Um, and one of the few glimmers of hope that I have seen is actually the uh, um, Russians protesting against the war in the streets of Moscow and, and Petersburg under, I mean, uh, 1,700, I think, is the most recent. Today, 1,700 Russians were arrested protesting the war, which means thousands more were protesting as well. Um, and sanctions of the type that Biden is talking about do have the potential to, like, hurt the economy and make things really worse for regular Russians. Um, and that, um, that is, I think, an unknown uh, for Putin and for us. Yeah. yeah. What would be some economic interests of Ukraine, such as agriculture, oil, rare, rare metals? Agriculture's huge. Uh, they're big um, wheat producer. Um, not, you know, they obviously have coal. Uh, what that's worth as a West Virginian, uh, I don't know whether that's, um, too, too, too much to really, I mean, I, I, I think that um, the, the it, it doesn't seem like there's a real good economic reason that this, this if, you know, there, there are reasons, it's not 1941 when Hitler's invading Ukraine uh, to get agricultural land and uh, access to the oil in the Caucasus. Uh, I think it really, we only have these other ideas of spheres of influence and the question of NATO and um, kind of great power politics. Uh, that would be my guess. Yeah. I mean, realistically, no, not, not while there are, um, uh, and honestly, after Crimea was taken, that option was largely off the table. Um, because if they were, then everyone would be that instant treaty bound to defend them. And so war would, war would start at that moment. If, if Ukraine could join NATO now, um, and the fact that there are Russian soldiers like in the country attacking it means probably not. What would that mean to NATO? It would mean that they were, if they signed it, it would mean they were at war. So the countries that make up NATO are not gonna sign it. Yeah, 
so the question is, uh, Putin in his speeches often uses this as a defense against Nazism or to attack the Nazis in Kiev or whatever. Um, and uh, so when uh, the invasion of the Soviet Union happens, um, especially in places like Ukraine, but not exclusively, um, this is a people that a decade before had been the victims of a horrible famine and of incredible repression by Stalin politically, um, economically, and in terms of their access to food. Uh, and so actually, um, some people looked to the Nazis and their allies, it was the Romanians and the Hungarians, as um, uh, a savior and as a liberator from Stalinist rule. Now, uh, the, the German occupation was so harsh that it's a, it was a tiny number of people. And um, those people were very anti-Semitic. I mean, they really did have um, close associations um, with anti-Semitism and committed attacks against various people, not just Jews, against Poles in the region and all kinds of things like that. And so that's a, that's a, a story of history that I think is a great example because it's, it's true. Right? There were um, uh, people who supported the Nazis who were Ukrainian nationalists who fought alongside of them and committed atrocities, committed genocide. Uh, they were a very small portion of, um, uh, of Ukrainians. Uh, and, uh, you know, but that was a story that was very much told in Soviet history textbooks, right? That clearly these were the bad people, nationalists. It always leads to these kind of things. And so that kind of fear of, of nationalism was certainly there. And so he's repeating something that people know about, I, Bandera. People know about him as a sort of uh, a, a boogeyman character if they live through Soviet schooling. Uh, and so it has a certain gradience. On the other hand, uh, the president of, of uh, Ukraine is Jewish. Um, and so these are pretty uh, laughable accusations. I mean, there are, I'm sure, anti-Semites and, and neo-Nazis in Ukraine. I mean, it's a free society. They're, they're in Tennessee, too. Um, what their role is, I mean, I think that the far-right nationalists in the most recent election got something like 3% of the vote, which in my opinion is still way too much, um, but also do doesn't indicate that that's actually what's going on there in the government. But that's a very important question, uh, again, when we're talking about the way history is being deployed there, and it really cuts right to the heart of this. Yeah? And so you might have to repeat it a little bit louder. No, I mean, Russia is a huge country, millions, hundreds of millions of people. Um, and uh, there, are, there are a lot of people, and, and they suffered immensely. I mean, million, tens of millions of Russians and Soviets and Kazakhs and Ukrainians died in this war. Uh, you know, uh, the city that Vladimir Putin was born in, Leningrad, was under siege for over 700 days. His parents lived through it. He had an older brother who died uh, of starvation, basically, in that uh, siege. Um, so the war is a memory for people there. Um, but I don't think it, the, the war is also a memory of our moment of heroism and when we came together and when we defeated the, the Nazi invader. Um, and you know, I think more commonly, uh, especially for people who lived through it, is a, a sort of a talk of the, the good old days when Ukrainians and Russians worked together to fight the Nazis, right? Obviously, nationalism has uh, affected Russia in major ways as well, and there's all kinds of um, movements and all kinds of ideas. Um, but I don't, I wouldn't say that there's sort of that level. Uh, I wouldn't really connect it to those things. Does Putin see himself as one of the older czars in Russian history? Like the flag there on the right, that looks like the old czarist emblem. 
Or would you prefer it was a hammer and sickle? I, <laughs> well, well, I mean, does, I, I does, does he look at himself as like Peter the Great, Catherine the Great? I mean, and all that? I, I think that's levels of psychology that I would ask my psychology colleagues to get into. I really, I, I mean, I, I, I think that certainly, um, you know, if we have to make analogies. Uh, he's a former KGB guy. Mm -hmm. Grew up Mm -hmm. Parents, as you said, mm -hmm. I, I didn't know about his parents. Mm -hmm. And does he have other relatives that he lost during the war? I mean, I'm sure. Towards you in Ukraine. Well, but they wouldn't have been Ukrainians like yeah, who they killed. Been they, well, they wouldn't have been Ukrainians. They would have been Germans who would have killed him. I mean, like the Germans are the ones invading. You know, yeah. like so. Uh, I, I no, I don't think that there's that levels of animosity. The I don't know. I always get a little hesitant about the. The historical EFC trying to recreate the Soviet Union or recreate the Russian Empire. Neither of them are perfect. I mean, he's just. He made reference to that in his speech, though. Well, that's what was he, he has made reference. He's made reference to the history. He's made reference to the way the lines, the borders of Ukraine were drawn uh, by uh, Lenin and the Bolsheviks in 1918 and later in the 20s. He has made reference to that, but also in the same speech he said that, that, that those were wrong and that Lenin's utopian ideas were wrong and foolish. So I, I don't know. I mean, I think those only get you so far. I mean, you know, power is power. And, and in many ways, the Soviet Union was an empire just like the Russian Empire. Um, so yeah, the analogy sort of works, but also it, I think it has, has limits. Did we're talking about fighting. What about the yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, that's I'm probably one of the things. I mean, I think generally there's a, it seems like he feels like Russia's being disrespected. I mean, and in a, you know, before the Second World War, if leaders were disrespected, like wars did start, right? I mean, the Franco-Prussian War is basically over a, a mix-up of a telegram, right, uh, uh, in 1871. I, I think that there is a feeling that for him, that Russia's been disrespected, G8 is part of that, NATO expansion is part of that, the Iraq war is part of that, the war in Libya is part, like there's a lot of, of complaints that he lists again and again and again. And the fundamentally, I think you're onto something, it's about why aren't you listening to me? Why aren't you uh, respecting me? And that I think is potentially a problem. Did everyone want to get, uh, did you have a uh, Yes, my best friend is stuck in the Ukrainian embassy right now. China and Russia just signed a non-aggression pact about two days ago. Do you think that China will move on Taiwan now that they have a non-aggression pact? <laughs> Here's a news report that they had. So I, I did not think until two days ago that we were going to invade Ukraine. So I don't think you should ask me that question. <laughs> I mean, honestly. I, 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 I mean, I, I think that the thing that we know is that anything can happen, right? I mean, and that's what we should be aware of. The, th the unthinkable happens, not all the time, but it does happen. Um, and I think war was unthinkable in Ukraine. Um, I was just talking to a friend today, this morning, who um, has family in Kharkiv, which is a big city right on the border of Ukraine, and um, their, their, their family is there, and they were they were beating themselves up because they didn't think that war was going to happen, and so they didn't have them go somewhere else. Right? Uh, you never know. Did you? Then we'll get to is it. More pro is, what, which is more pro uh, probable? Is this a counter-defensive measure on Putin's part to create a buffer between NATO and, and him, or um, is it also perhaps likely that um, Latvia, Belarus, Belarus, the other Baltic states are also at risk, uh, or a little bit A week ago, I would have said, no, absolutely no chance that any of this up. I do think that the NATO problem is, is protection for the Baltics. Um, I think that the more common discussion is, does this mean that places like Finland are now going to join NATO, who hadn't been a part of NATO before? Um, and what is that? Does that change the conversation? Um, but again, I, yeah, I, I don't really know. So what's the daily life in Moscow of your modern Russian citizen? I mean, you have to, and I have to ask myself, what does he gain if, if it's not a weak basket, if it's not a power source? What is it? that the common Russian citizen is going 
Um, I think that that question is exactly why I didn't think this would happen, uh, because it doesn't make much sense from what really the just like typical rational actor reasons of economics and uh, even defensive policy and things like that. Um, and it certainly doesn't make any sense economically. Uh, I think it's, it's Russian economy is already in trouble. Um, Moscow is, does better than everywhere else. Um, but uh, what people would gain, then, then you're welcome at it. But like, this, is the, this is the big conversation that none of us know. It's all very confusing because it's not clear what there is for him to gain at all. Um, other than these, like, some people are really thinking, like, he's just, he's just lost it, right? Um, which is also possible, too. Very confusing. Very confusing. I mean, I think that's, that's really it. Partly why uh, clinging to the history as much as I can, because uh, the rest doesn't make sense. I have two questions. One will be easier. Um, would you introduce yourself and yeah. tell us where and what your terminal degree was? Yeah. Uh, uh, my name is uh, Jack Seitz. Uh, my Seitz. Uh, I have a PhD in uh, history from Iowa State University. Yeah. That's nice to know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, sorry. question kind of goes back to what you described as the famine of the early 30s. All of the uh, human rights groups have categorized it as one of the five largest intentional genocides ever perpetrated on a people. And it occurred to me, under Stalin, yeah. and it occurred to me that when Ukraine declared its independence after the fall of the Soviet republics, that every adult Ukrainian would remember their family members who were slaughtered by Russians. And just as Jews today remember the Holocaust, Americans remember slavery. We have ethno and cultural memories that are long and strong. Sure. Here we are 30 years later, another whole generation of people who would have this, this mistrust of, of Russia. And my question, I'm having a hard time phrasing it. You've made a great case for the fact that Crimean people, excuse me, Ukrainian people are, have, have long been, I think you went back a thousand years or more, a, a, a people in search of, of a linguistic and cultural stability. And it's always been elusive. With them not being a part of NATO, what is this, I guess my question is, what does this mean for us as Americans? You look back as a historian and look ahead perhaps as a prophet. <laughs> I'll, I'll ask uh, William McDonald to answer the prophet part, <laughs> prophecy part, maybe. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that these are the, I mean, these really are the questions, right, of, uh, of, of history and of, uh, and of, you know, being a people, right, that, that uh, these stories of what it means to be Ukrainian are contested, these stories of what it means to be American are contested, um, and that that's really the only, that's the only answer I really have. I mean, that these memories are long, but they're also, you know, um, uh, quite complicated. I mean, a lot of people, a lot of um, Ukrainians also look back very fondly on the Soviet Union, right? Um, and you just can't really know like what individual experiences are going to be. I mean, and I think that that's the that's the like elusive part about national identity, right? Is that what it means to be an American is different to me than it might be from you, from someone else. Same thing for being a Ukrainian. That these are actually really slippery things. And so, you know, when 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 Putin is up there saying, you know, here are all the reasons Ukraine hasn't existed and doesn't exist as a country and as a people, you can say the exact same things about any other country in the world, right? Like that, that they all have these complicated histories and that people have always been uh, changing their identities and they're always works in progress. So for, for me as a historian and thinking about America, 
uh, I think that it means, yeah, we need to get real about realities of history. I mean, in the same way that Putin needs to not be telling these, these half-truths for political ends that are really anti-human, uh, you know, we need to be doing the same thing and we need to be, really be reckoning with them. I mean, and that's why I actually was kind of glad that um, I had it in my notes and I just didn't have time that uh, Dr. Will had asked the question about Bandera and the fascists. Like, they were there. And I think that a, like, a, a truthful reckoning with that, then you see what it actually, how it actually fits into this story and it's there, but it's not, it's not the main part and it makes it harder to kind of abuse this one-off thing. If that answers, I don't know. Sorry. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that it's, it's, it's different. I don't think that these are connected, but I do think that this they, they do, but I think more that the, more, the greater likelihood is that there are real problems within uh, the peace agreement in Bosnia right now, right? That there's, an, there's a very strong upswing of um, Serbian nationalism inside of Bosnia, right? And inside the, the Serbian part. And that they have very much been tampering with a very fragile peace. Uh, and so, it's already something that I think the, that, that the sort of Europe and, and the United States weren't paying enough attention to, and I think that this is likely something else that's going to distract them even more, and that, that I, di I do have that same worry. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think um, that <laughs> we'll, we'll, go one, we'll go one more. Uh, How did Belarus end up being the state scenario for this? Mm -hmm. The government of Belarus, yes. Um, as you may recall, Belarus had significant anti-government protests just a few years ago and has been propped up by uh, Putin as a close ally uh, for a while, basically since independence. They've had the same leader since independence. Um, and uh, the ties between Belarus and Russia are very close. They're in a very close economic union and the political ties are even closer. I doubt they had much choice. Um, the leader uh, probably would have said yes anyway. I don't know. I mean, I, I think that, um, yeah, Belarus is a whole other thing, but it's largely, a, and it's very, very close in the Russian camp, very much so, yeah. Uh, thanks for your, your time and for your questions. Really appreciate it. Here in Athens.